This is Hillsborough, the home of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. On the 15th of April 1989, it was the scene of the worst disaster in British football history. Though 23 years have passed, the pain and sense of injustice that surrounds the Hillsborough disaster, particularly on Merseyside, has never gone away. That's despite the fact that a judicial inquiry made it crystal clear that the 96 deaths were the direct result of terrible mistakes made by senior police officers who were in charge that day. For the past two years, a panel of independent experts has been examining every official document from around the time of the Hillsborough disaster. On Wednesday, the panel releases its report. Only then will we discover if they found any new and significant information. Tonight, we hear the stories of some of those most intimately involved as we try to find out whether we can ever really know the truth about Hillsborough. The clock was locked on Theo 6. The sun shone down upon the pitch, lighting up faces etched in pain as death descended on Leppings Lane. Between the bars, an arm is raised amidst a human tidal wave. A body too young to fight for breath is drowned below a sea of death. What I regret is not being with my son when he most needed me. I resent everybody who done wrong to James. It took me a long, long time to understand the anger, because I was angry. I, they were angry with me, I was angry with them for accusing me of basically killing people. When I saw the headline, The Truth, I was aghast, because that wasn't what I'd written. So is the lingering anger over Hillsborough simply a case of grieving families who can't get over the death of their loved ones? Or are the families of the dead in fact fully justified to still be furious over the lies that were told in the aftermath of the disaster? On the 15th of April 1989, Hillsborough was the chosen neutral venue for the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. Thousands of Liverpool fans made their way across the Pennines. Many journeys were delayed by huge traffic problems on the M62. One of the 96 Hillsborough victims who made the journey that day was James Aspinall. Only 18, James had just started his first job after leaving school in Knowsley. He travelled to Sheffield with his friend Graham Wright. Both died. The thing I do regret most is not saying to James, be safe. The last thing I done for James was put his cross and chain on. I'd bought him three weeks before that um, a belt of train for his 18th birthday and he couldn't always put the clasp on himself and that morning going out to the game he just said to me mum will you put me chain on please and the last words I said to James is you'll have to learn to do this yourself James your mum won't always be around. Dave Kirby is a writer and a fanatical Liverpool fan. In the 80s, he followed his team across the country. On the day of the disaster, he made the 80 miles trip from Liverpool to Sheffield. It was the second year in a row that Liverpool had played in an FA Cup semi-final at Hillsborough. Funny enough, it was a lovely day like today. It was um, sunshine and it was 12 months previous that we'd been there before. Very, very similar circumstances. We played Nottingham Forest in the semi-final. So you see this tunnel and you can see the pitch, a bit of the pitch through the tunnel and you just automatically think you go down that tunnel and then disperse inside. But little did you know that when you got in there it was a pen, I mean a complete enclosed pen. John Wilson was a young South Yorkshire police officer in 1989. While events were escalating at Hillsborough, John was elsewhere in the stadium dealing with an arrest he'd made that afternoon. With all officers being scrambled to the Leppings Lane end, John found himself without a police radio, having to react instinctively to the horror that was unfolding. We got to know that something was going wrong. Now, I think the intimation was that it was some trouble, as in fighting or whatever it was. The official inquiry by Lord Justice Peter Taylor confirmed that Police Commander David Duckenfield had ordered that Gate C be opened. This was to reduce a potentially life-threatening crush by the turnstiles outside the ground. But Lord Taylor found that rather than helping the situation, Duckenfield's fateful decision actually led to the disaster. The rush of fans who went through the gate made for the most obvious entrance to the Leppings Lane Terrace. Thousands of fans now tried to enter through a narrow tunnel into two already overcrowded central pens. 
Within minutes, fans were dead or dying. We got to the tunnel entrance and it was fairly full. But you could see people look, starting to come, come away and you could, as we walked down the tunnel, we struggled to get through. You could see bodies on the floor of people. Uh, now obviously they, they appeared dead at that stage. Uh, so we walked down, down the tunnel. As we are walking down the tunnel, people were saying, it, you know, what's the effect? It's your fault, it's effing and blinding. And I didn't really understand why at that, t at that point. People were screaming at the scream. I mean, the, the unmerciful screams. And that's what lives with you, you know, years later, the, the, the screams that you're hearing, and the things that you're seeing. But that stage with you, then people started, they started realising something terrible was going on. But the police still didn't react, you know. It was, it was so bizarre. Because, you know, the fans that day, they reacted quicker than the authorities. These days, Mark Edwardson is a reporter on BBC Northwest Tonight. But on the day of the match, he was a young Liverpool fan with a prized semi-final ticket for the Leppings Lane end. He found himself in the midst of the deadly crush. I was stood face to face uh, with, with this, this bloke who, I, I didn't know, I hadn't gone to the match with him, I just ended up being face to face with him uh, in this crush. And we were, we were chest to chest, we were nose to nose. Um, and I was getting to a point where I, I didn't want to breathe out because I was worried that if I breathed out, I wouldn't be able to breathe in again. I realised that down by our legs there was more space, so I, I started to sort of wriggle, wriggle down really. And I'd got, only gone down a couple of inches. Uh, and this this man who I I know it sounds trite, but I, I kind of owe my life to. I think. Uh, just screamed at me straight away. He knew exactly what I was going to do, and he could see that I was going down. And he, and he, he just screamed, "Don't let him do it! Don't let him do it! You'll never let him will come back! Don't be stupid! Don't be stupid! Stop! Stop! Stop!" And he, he was he was wasting his breath. His, his maybe he may have thought that was his last as well. I, I don't know to, to stop me from doing what I was, and, and that was it. And that, that's when I realised. I thought, I've, if I've got to do something about this, I've got to at least stay up because that's actually the only way I'm I'm, I'm going to stay alive. Because if I, if I go down the gate would close over the top of me and that would have been the end that would have been absolutely the end of me um, he realized that and you know I, I, I thank him to this day because without him I you know it could have been a different story the police were just like rabbits in the headlights and I mean there was about six or seven officers near the, near the fence and you had reporters taking pictures of the, of the carnage and stuff you know and it, but there was no one reacting you know it was, it was horrendous and the people in the stands behind were pulling them up everyone knew there was something catastrophic going on but the police just didn't react. By the time a policeman, you know, did did react, it was far too late. And the next thing, we're going down this tunnel, which which seems like a, a cave. It's, it seems really dark, and all these people are coming out, and there are bodies on the floor, and you, it doesn't really register at first, and it didn't register for some time after the actual incident. So then we got through the people in the tunnel. Uh, and started to go down the terrace, which was still pretty full. As we went down the terrace, obviously there were bodies on the terraced area, and we made our way, uh, our way towards uh, one individual who was on the floor, one youngish lad, who I can't really remember a lot about, apart from some of his clothing I can remember. Uh, and a colleague of mine was already there, trying to revive him, giving him mouth to mouth and all that, so I got down to do the same. Uh, so we were both chest compressions, mouth to mouth. And while we were there, I know people were throwing coins down and we could hear people effing and blinding, swearing and shouting. And there were people up there who were obviously really upset and really angry. And, and, that, and you know, in retrospect, that's understandable. From then on, we, uh, we were assigned to actually move, physically move bodies from the terraced area and through the gate, the perimeter gate around the pitch which we did, we were about 15 people through there. There was another man I remember quite distinctly from that day, although I've, I've no idea who he was or, or what he looked like. And that was because in the crush I got turned around, so I was, had my, my head, the back of my head to the pitch, uh, and he was behind me, and he was, he was up against one of the crush bars in the, in the pen. And to, to describe his, his words as harrowing is, is really understating just how, how horrific it must have been for him because he, he was he was pleading with me to give him some space. I, I was back to back with him. He was pleading with me to give him some space, and, and he, was, he said, "I'm having a heart attack. I'm having a heart attack. You, you've got to give me some space. I'm I'm dying." Um, 
But of course, by this stage, I, I couldn't move. Nobody else could move in there. This is a football match where things like that don't happen. You know, I'd never seen anything like that. I was uh, almost 29. I'd never seen anything like that. I'd seen dead people before I joined the job, but never in circumstances like that. Can you remember anything about the people that you were having to move, or...? Not a thing. I can't. Just this predominantly they were male. Oh, they seem to, from what I can remember, they were male. Obviously, looking back now, they were male. But other than that, I can't remember a thing. I, I don't see faces. I don't see features when I look back. It's just a, a blank face. You don't see a nose, a mouth, eyes. You just see a blank face. I can't put any features on people's faces. I can't distinctly remember the kid that we tried to revive. You know, I've, I've looked in a statement and that refers to clothing. And I think he got light coloured hair. Would you like to be able to remember him? I'd like to know that he, <coughs> I'd like to know he survived. I'll, I'll probably never know that. For Margaret Aspinall, there was still the gruesome duty of visiting her son at the makeshift morgue that had been set up at Sheffield Wednesday. And you were waiting, somebody offers you a cup of tea, and I just said, I just want to see me son. Please take me to me son. He's my son, I want to, I want to know that his mum's it. Okay, okay, calm down, calm down. I eventually get called through to this room. And I remember them, there's a blue curtain, a glass or petition, a big glass petition. And they just said to me, are you ready? And I said, ready for what? I just want my son. And they pull the curtain back. Up the curtain, and I saw my son. And I said, I need to cuddle him. They wouldn't let me go in to give him a kiss. They wouldn't let me cuddle him or anything. And I said, I need to go in to my son, please. I need to take him home. I've got, I've got his coat here. I'll take him home. And somebody, I don't know who it was, just said to me, Mrs. Aspinall, he does not belong to you no more. He belongs to the coroner. But even as the disaster was unfolding, an alternative version of the truth was being spun by senior South Yorkshire police officers. The police match commander, David Duckenfield, lied to a senior official from the Football Association, saying it was the Liverpool fans who'd forced the exit gate. The BBC weren't alone in reporting this erroneous version of events. The main story this evening, 74 football supporters are reported to have been crushed to death at the FA Cup final at Hillsborough in Sheffield this afternoon. Hundreds more were injured. Fans rushed through a broken turnstile, crushing Liverpool supporters against the front of the stand. It happened on the day that a false story was being manufactured by the police. Duckenfield was telling the FA executive in the control room, the fans pushed their way in and forced their way in. And of course it was built on. They were, they were drunk, they didn't have tickets, it's their fault. Now that, that was the start, that was the seed. He knew, and it was called by a judge, an outrageous lie. And it was an outrageous lie, but the lie has stuck. Can you understand some of the the bitterness 